Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, open the lock. We're given a lock that has four circular wheels and each of the wheels actually represents some digit and that digit could be from zero all the way up until nine. So there's 10 possibilities for each digit. The lock initially starts at zero, 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 zero. So it's a string with four zeros, which represents the state of the four wheels. And for each of these digits, it can be changed similar to how a real life wheel would work. So each one of these digits could be incremented or it could be decremented. So one could be incremented to two, or it could be decremented down to zero. Uh, but you might notice what happens if we increment nine? Well, incrementing nine would lead to 10, which is not a possible a value. So it, it basically completes a cycle. So it would actually go to zero. Uh, similarly, decrementing zero would to take us uh, in the reverse direction to positive nine. But to make this problem more difficult, we are given a list of dead ends. And what that means is, uh, let's say we started at zero, 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 uh, and we change this wheel, right? Then we would have this. If we incremented that wheel, we'd have this. Uh, and let's, let's say we incremented this uh, wheel, then we'd have this. And you can see that this is actually in the list of dead ends that were given in the input, uh, this one actually. And basically what that means is if we reach a dead end, then we cannot continue. So basically this is an invalid position. We're never allowed to uh, reach this state in the wheel. Uh, we're also given a target and our goal is to reach this target from the starting point and to do it in the minimum number of total turns of our lock. But if it's not possible, and it might not be possible because uh, if we have you know, some dead ends that completely block us from ever reaching that, then we have to return negative one. Otherwise we return that number of moves that it takes us, the minimum that it takes us to reach this. So how do we even approach a problem like this one? Well, suppose we start at zero, zero, zero. Well, we know that this is how we are gonna start. And for each of these digits, we know we have two choices. We can increment it or we can decrement it. And we know that you know there's a cycle involved as well. But basically, these are what the possibilities look like. Basically, for each of these digits, we have two choices. So we could create uh, these two. We could have the lock look like this if we ended up manipulating this one, or we could have this as the output, these or these, right? In total, we have eight different choices of what we could do starting here. And for each of these children, we also have eight different choices, right? But of course, one of the choices like this one, uh, you know, if we incremented this one, we're gonna end up uh, getting zero, 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 uh, which is, you know, back where we started. So of course we never want to revisit the same one twice, right? So it's probably good for us to have some kind of data structure, let's say a hash set that we call visit and we never revisit the same one because because of course we're trying to find the shortest path. So why would we uh, wanna uh, have like a cycle? There's no point in doing that. Also, suppose we took this one and incremented this bit. The output would look like this, but notice how this is actually in our dead ends. So basically if we reach this value or this node inside of our decision tree that we're drawing, we would stop. We would not continue doing that. We know this is never going to lead us to the target. But if we ever did reach the target, of course we would stop. But this is clearly a very large decision tree. I'm not gonna draw out the whole thing, but there could be many ways to get to the target. How do we know we're finding the shortest one? Well, one way would be to do backtracking, right? A brute force approach, basically for this one, you know, keep going until either we, you know, can't go any further or we end up actually reaching the target. And we could do that for every single path, but that might not be the most efficient. How do we know that we found the shortest path? Well, the idea is simple, and this is usually what we do in shortest path algorithms. It's called breadth first search. Because notice this is uh, the possibilities after making zero moves, right? These are the possibilities after making a single move. And the children of these are going to be how many, if we, uh, the possibilities if we made two moves, et cetera, et cetera. And if we keep generating the locks in this order, we know that whenever we find the target in one of these layers, that that was for sure the shortest path to have reached it, right? 
Now that we know how we're going to solve this, let's analyze the time complexity. And in the worst case, we're going to possibly visit every single you know, lock combination. And we know that there's about 10,000 possibilities. So that's going to be the time complexity big O of 10,000. So that's all we really have to worry about. A similar memory complexity, we're going to be using a queue to actually imp implement this a BFS, but we also have a visit hash set. So the memory complexity is going to be the same as the time complexity. The worst case, it'll be 10,000. A couple last points before we jump into the code. There's actually one of the examples that they show us, not this one, but there's another example where the dead end could actually contain 000. And we know that this is always gonna be the starting lock. So if that's in the dead end's uh, input, which is kind of dumb in my opinion, then we know for sure that we can never have the target because this itself is the dead end, right? That's like our starting point. Okay, there's that, and there's one last thing. So to make the incrementing and decrementing of each digit a little bit cleaner, one thing I wanna show you is just a little trick we can use. We know it's pretty easy if we had zero as the digit and we added one to it, right? Then the output would be one. But what happens if we have nine and we add one to it, then uh, the output is 10, but it really should be zero. So how do we fix this? Well, after incrementing uh, the digit, we're always gonna mod the result by 10, which will lead us to some value between zero through nine, and it'll be the correct value because in this case, nine plus one is 10, modded by uh, 10, is gonna be zero. That's exactly what we want when we increment nine. Also, if we had a regular positive value like zero, added one to it, we'd get one in the output. Modding it by 10 is still gonna have uh, the output be one, right? That's exactly what we want. It keeps it like that and that works uh, for every number. Now doing it with decrementing is a little bit more tricky. If we had nine minus one, that equals eight and then we mod it by 10, uh, that will uh, leave us with eight as well. That's exactly what we want. But there's an example that doesn't work. We have zero minus one. This leads to negative one and then modding that by 10, but it won't really work in most languages. We know that mod 10 is an operation that cancels out tens, right? Factors of 10. Uh, and the problem here is really that this is negative one. Uh, what happens uh, if we add 10 to it, then we get this to be positive nine. Uh, and then mod that by 10 and it'll stay positive nine. So that's exactly what we want. So when we're decrementing a number, we're gonna get the output and then add 10 to it and then mod it by 10 again and we're gonna get the correct output. It'll work in every example. Let me just show you with nine. So a nine minus one, we get eight plus 10 is gonna be 18. You can see how this is gonna work, right? Because modding this by 10 is just gonna reverse the addition of this 10. So the output will still be eight, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so now let's code it up. So now let's code it up. And like I said, first of all, we're going to have that initial case. If the starting point is in dead ends, then of course we can't do anything. Uh, and then we're gonna get started on our BFS. So that's usually implemented with a queue. In Python, we can use a queue like this, a double-ended queue. And of course, we're going to continue while our queue is non-empty. There's multiple ways to do this. We want to actually count the number of moves that it takes us to reach the result. So what we could do is have an inner loop inside of this one and then use that to count. But also, we could do something like this, where every value in our queue is going to be a pair of values. And the starting point is going to be this. And the other value is gonna be the number of moves it took us to reach here. So, so let's call it this lock is gonna be the, you know, what the lock is right now. Turns is gonna be the number of turns we've made so far. Initially, it's gonna be zero. Uh, and the second data structure we're gonna use is a hash set. So we can do that like this in Python. Okay, now we can get started. We know that every iteration of the loop uh, we're going to not append, we're gonna pop from the left and we're gonna push to the right. But once we pop from the left, we're going to get the current state of the lock uh, and the number of turns it took us to get here. If the lock ever reaches the target, we are going to return the number of turns that it took. Otherwise, what are we gonna do? We're going to get all eight of the children of this lock as I showed in the decision tree. Let's just call it uh, children, right? Uh, and let's create a helper function to actually get the children and let's define that out over here just to make things cleaner for us. 
Uh, and what we're going to do with those children is iterate through each of them. I'm not even going to implement this function just yet. I'm just going to show you how the logic is going to work. Assume we have that right now. Let's go through every child in the children of that lock. So let's actually pass the lock itself in there to make it even more clear. And for each of these ch uh, children, we're going to, of course, append it to the queue. So queue.append this child uh, and the number of moves it took us to get here, the number of turns, which is going to be turns plus one because for the parent, uh, which is up here, lock, it took us this many turns. So to get to the child, it's going to take turns plus one. Uh, and we're also going to want to mark it as visited so but that we don't ever visit it again. So uh, visit.add this child. But one thing you might be noticing is what if this has already been visited before? Then we don't want to re-add it to the queue. So let's wrap this around uh, with an if statement. So if child not in visit, then uh, do the following. So we, believe it or not, have most of the logic done, uh, but we know that if we don't end up reaching the result, right, if we never reach the target, then we want to return negative one once our queue is empty and we have searched every position that we possibly could. Oh, and actually one more thing before we implement the children function, we didn't actually check if the child happened to be in the dead ends. So what should we do to check that? Well, we can use another hash set, right? We can call it dead ends and it can be a hash set of all that list of dead ends but the, uh, why use multiple hash sets and then check both of them how about we just take all of these dead ends and initialize the visit set with all of them basically indicating that we uh, don't want to ever uh, visit these they've already been visited but in reality they're dead ends right we never we haven't visited them and we don't ever want to visit them so basically by checking visit we're also making sure we don't reach a dead end okay now to actually do the children helper function. We know we're going to generate all eight children of this lock uh, and that's going to be a list. So let's call it result. Uh, and we know that this lock has four digits. So let's do a, a for loop that runs four times. So I is going to be which uh, index we're looking at in this lock string. And now I'm basically just going to be doing the math that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, but first of all, lock, uh, we want it the character at index i. Uh, but if we know it's a character, we want it to actually be converted into an integer. So let's do that. And to this integer, we want to add one to it. And we also want to subtract one from it. But we'll do that in a moment. And after we add one to it, what do we want to do? Then we want to make sure we mod it by 10 because in the case that we have a nine and we increment nine we don't want it to be 10 so we're gonna mod this by 10 and then we actually want to convert it back into a string so a lot of stuff is going on in this one line so i hope it's not too confusing but then yeah we're going to convert it back into a string assign it to that to a to a variable called digit let's say and then insert it into the lock string which we can do like this in Python. Strings are immutable. We can't modify them, so we have to rebuild a string. So we're gonna get uh, every character before index i, which you can do like this in Python. And then we wanna take that digit and insert it in the middle like this. And then after that, we want to get every uh, character after index i, and we can do that like this, i plus uh, one. Um, and yeah, so then uh, we're uh, building this, but actually we don't want to reassign lock now that I think about it. We want to take this and append it to the result. It's a child of the result. So let's say result dot append and that's it. So uh, now let's just copy and paste this because we're going to do something very similar for negative one. So let's uh, do that. So the difference is uh, we're going to be subtracting one from it, but after we subtract one from it, we're going to add 10 to it, mainly because of what I showed you a moment ago in the drawing explanation. So I won't cover it again, uh, but that's, I think, pretty much it. We will have, you know, created eight children for this lock, and then we want to make sure to return those children. Some of them might be invalid. Uh, what I mean by that is some of them might have been visited or some of them might be dead ends, but we know that here where the children helper function is actually being called, we're immediately checking that have those been visited are those dead ends uh, we'll make sure to check that before we uh, update our queue okay now let's run this to make sure that it works and i don't even know how i missed that i forgot to actually return the result okay now you can see that on the left yes it does work and it pretty much is about as efficient as you can get it so i really hope that this was helpful if it was please like and subscribe it really supports the channel a lot consider checking out my patreon where you can further support the channel and hopefully i'll see you pretty soon thanks for watching